Good evening. I'm Michael Gorman, a fellow at the Institute for Human Ecology here at the Catholic University of America. One of the IHE's main goals is to sponsor academic conversations like the one we're about to have, and we're very much looking forward to hearing from our guests tonight. In November 2019, Marco Rubio spoke at CUA's own Bush School of Business, and he talked about common good capitalism. We revisit that idea tonight from a variety of perspectives. Here to moderate our conversation is Kevin Augustine. Let me tell you a few things about him. Kevin Augustine has an MPhil and further doctoral level work in church history from the Catholic University of America. He also has an MDiv in pastoral theology and an STB in sacred theology from St. John Vianney Theological Seminary, along with a BA in philosophy from the Franciscan University of Steubenville. He's now a visiting fellow with the Mercatus Center's program on pluralism and civil exchange. Previously, he worked as a program officer at the Charles Koch Foundation. Prior to that, he served as the Director of Development, College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and an adjunct professor at George Mason University. His work with Mercatus focuses on liberalism and pluralism in religious thought. And now, without further ado, I hand you over to Kevin Augustine. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Americans are, uh, it's seeming, seemingly so, are increasingly skeptical of markets and commerce. Many call for a reorientation of capitalism towards the common good. Most notably, as uh, Dr. Gorman mentioned, Senator Marco Rubio in a sp speech given here at CUA. Free enterprise alone cannot give human persons their due, the argument goes, and policies and situations must therefore be reorient reoriented towards a substantive vision of human flourishing. How should the public respond to the growing popularity of common good capitalism? What are its prospects and perils? Most importantly, what resources exist within the Christian intellectual tradition to evaluate it? To begin to answer these questions, we have here with us tonight three very distinguished scholars. I'm gonna abbreviate their uh, biographies because their, um, their accomplishments are quite lengthy. Dr. Alexander William Salter is Comparative Economics Research Fellow at the Free Market Institute and Georgie G. Snyder, Associate Professor of Economics in the J Jerry S. Rawls College of Business Administration at Texas Tech University. He earned his BA in Economics at, from Occidental College and his MA and PhD in Economics from George Mason University. In addition to conducting scholarly research, Dr. Salter is a senior fellow with the American Institute for Economic Research's Sound Money Project and serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Private Enterprise. Dr. Salter's new book, From Property, Liberty, is under final review with CUA Press. It surveys the applicability of Catholic social teaching to common good capitalism by analyzing distributism, mostly Belloc and Chesterton, to see points of contact with contemporary mainstream economics as well as points of departure. Dr. Mary Hirschfeld is Associate Professor of Economics and Theology in the Department of Humanities at Villanova University. A professor at Villanova since 2011, Dr. Hirschfeld regularly teaches the Humanities Gateways, Society and God course and honors ACS seminars, Ancients and Moderns. She completed a PhD in economics from, at Harvard under the direction of Lawrence Summers and Jeffrey Williamson, and a PhD in moral theology at the University of Notre Dame under the direction of Jean Porter. Her research is on the border, excuse me, on the boundary between economics and theology, culminating in her book, Aquinas and the Market Toward a Humane Economy, which came out in 2018 uh, from Harvard University Press. Dr. Samuel Gregg is research director at the Acton Institute. He has written and spoken extensively on questions of political economy, economic history, ethics and finance, and natural law theory. He is an MA from the University of Melbourne and a doctor of philosophy degree in moral philosophy and political economy from the University of Oxford. Dr. Gregg oversees Acton's research program and team of scholars and is responsible for oversight of research uh, international programming, including budgeting management, uh, 
personnel publishing and program development and implementation. He's the author of 13 books and co-editor of many others. Two of his books have been shortlisted for Conservative Book of the Year. Many of his books and articles have been translated into a variety of languages. This is the one I'm cutting short. <laughs> now, he's a regu he regularly publishes in, high, uh, in highly regarded peer-reviewed journals and is a regular writer of opinion pieces which appear in other intellectual and popular publications. So we're really blessed and uh, lucky to have three excellent scholars with us tonight. Our evening will begin with a presentation by Dr. Salter on common good capitalism, followed by responses by Dr. Hirsch, uh, by Dr. Gregg and then by Dr. Hirschfeld. We'll then open it up to questions. So without further ado, Dr. Salter. Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm very excited to introduce the topic of common good capitalism to get this panel discussion started. Before I get too far along, can everyone hear me okay? Pull it up a little bit. Better? Excellent. The title of our panel is Common Good Capitalism, Prospects and Perils. And I think it's important to emphasize both aspects of this new paradigm, this way of thinking about the interrelatedness of political and economic phenomena that has burst onto the scene and commands our attention, especially as an alternative and remoralized perspective on private enterprise. So I'm excited to share with you my thoughts on that, and then we'll get to the rest of the panelists and have a, what I'm sure will be a fascinating back and forth discussion. As Kevin did a good job of highlighting, a recent address given by Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio right here at the Catholic University of America, really hits home this theme of common good capitalism. And I'm going to read this quote because I think of the entire speech, which I recommend that everybody read because it is lucid, eminently uh, readable, and actually contains many interesting ideas. But if you wanted to reduce that speech to its essence, to find its takeaway, I would pick this quote. Common good capitalism is about a vibrant and growing free market, but it is also about harnessing and channeling that growth to the benefit of our country, our people, and our society. Because after all, our nation does not exist to serve the interests of the market. The market exists to serve our nation and our people. This is a wonderful summary, and it's also a stirring statement. I think that this quote does a good job of highlighting the discussions that we're going to have today. In particular, common good, common good capitalism does not reject free enterprise. It does not seek to subsume the private economy to any sort of command and control relationship. At the same time, in this paradigm, it's assumed that market forces, if left to themselves, will not necessarily comport to the common good. So we have a tension here. On the one hand, we are not trying to eliminate, shackle, constrain private enterprise. On the other hand, we need to pay attention to the moral context within which it operates and understand to what extent market forces are commensurate with the common good. And that's going to be largely what I wanna talk about this evening. There's been a bit of a realignment in American public affairs, political philosophy, political and economic thinking. This is something that has taken place chiefly on the American right, but not exclusively on the American right. This is really something that's suffusing, I would say, the entirety of the political spectrum. And really, you could spend hours talking about the realignments in American politics that have taken place in the last decade, since 2016 in particular, but I think for our purposes this evening, there are a few that we should pay particular attention to. First was a much publicized issue of the journal First Things, titled Against the Dead Consensus, in which case, uh, in which issue, the contributors to that volume wrote against what they called warmed over Reaganism. You may have heard the phrase uh, zombie Reaganism. And I was particularly happy to see this because as a personal unreconstructed Reaganite, that gave me a Halloween costume for the next two years. I was proud to go as zombie Ronald Reagan. Joking aside, this is a serious challenge. The argument that the standard line on the American right towards free enterprise, whatever its merits may have been, 
and the closing years of the Cold War. Whatever its merits may have been in recent years, no longer was adequate completely to address the problems of the day. So again, not abolishing private enterprise, not even shackling it so much, but instead redirecting our attention towards figuring out how to direct private enterprise to serve those ends which are constitutive of a well-governed nation. Two other thinkers whose work I'd like to highlight because it directly bears on this conversation, Patrick Deneen, the political philosopher who's challenging why liberalism failed, was and continues to be a topic of public conversation. Professor Deneen's thesis is that liberalism failed because of its successes. That's not an exact quote from the opening page of the book, but it's pretty close. Professor Deneen argues that many of the problems that we observe in public and contemporary life stem from the inherent tendencies of liberalism as a political philosophy, which recognizes no inherent limits and is inherently atomistically individualist. In addition, we have Professor Adrian Vermeule, the professor of administrative law at Harvard University, who advocates what he calls common good constitutionalism. Now this is obviously relevant to common good capitalism because it's also using this common good way of thinking to evaluate these concepts and topics. I highly recommend that you go and read his essay in The Atlantic, which was about a year ago, I think now, where he talks about his alternative uh, and preferred paradigm of constitutional interpretation of common good originalism, whereby into, in his words, we read into the vague generalities and oftentimes pregnant generalities of the Constitution, a philosophy that helps us comport to the common good. So what we're really observing here is, again, a rethinking of boundaries, not just between markets and states. If that's all this was, if this was just us moving the needle of the dividing line between what's the proper function of markets and what's the proper function of politics, this perhaps would not command the attention that it does. Instead, it is a significant challenge to existing philosophical categories and gets us just as much to think of redrawing the boundaries between persons, communities, and the rights and duties thereof. And this is one area where, in particular, Catholic social teaching has a lot to say and can and must be brought to bear on the conversation. Let's start with the easy case. What is common good capitalism not? What are we not saying when we're talking about common good capitalism? If there's one thing we're clear we're not saying, this is not just another conversation about the quote unquote third way. For decades, many people in Western societies have been having a conversation about a quote unquote third way between capitalism, private enterprise, and command economies, socialism. And again, the argument was where to draw the line, what public policies we wish to adopt to sort of push us into a happy medium that existed between these two extreme poles. This conversation, frankly, has never been that fruitful because it accepts in that same dimension of categorization, this way of observing and conceiving of private enterprise and socialism as differing social orders along a continuous spectrum that we more or less choose between grants too much to a paradigm that does not have a place for the rich communitarian personalism that advocates of the common good think must be brought to the conversation. We cannot just bring the old evaluative standards that we have applied to previous social institutions and carry them over into the conversation about common good capitalism. This is not just another way of thinking about income inequality, for example. This is not just another way of thinking about what consumption opportunities are available to American households. These are important questions, but every mode of analysis, every way of thinking about social problems has things that it carries in the analytical foreground and things that it rightly relegates to the analytical background. Consumption, income equality, these things matter, but they are not in the foreground. Instead, the categories that we need to be thinking of are in terms of meaningful work and economic independence, where independence specifically means the ability to say no to the market, the ability to have a next best option that entails, that entails excuse me, a certain amount of human dignity for every person, every family, every authentic human community. So what we really need to evaluate and put common good capitalism to work is a new or rather an old paradigm in political economy. And one of the things that I want to argue is that the distinction between economics and political economy is itself here meaningful. 
The Catholic intellectual tradition has given a lot of thought to these questions, starting with Rerum Novarum, the encyclical by Pope Leo XIII in the late 19th century, the church has rightly taught on social issues that we need to make sure that we analyze questions of production, distribution, economic systems with human dignity front and center. This is different than how economists usually talk about it. To the extent that economists usually evaluate social systems, we do so in terms of economic efficiency. And that's all well and good. There's nothing inherently wrong with efficiency. There's nothing inherently wrong with cost-benefit analyses. But what we need to recognize is that this, as a normative standard, does not do the work that many economists think it does. At the end of the day, we can quibble over technical definitions of efficiency all we want. All efficiency means, economically speaking, is that people are getting what they want. It is by no means ethically obvious that people should get what they want all the time. I think a little honest, simple introspection will tell us that we shouldn't always have the things that we ourselves want. And perhaps some way of looking at social order, which makes sure that we receive those goods that we are authentically due, might be something that's at least worth talking about. Whether such a thing is feasible or practical, and what the perils of that might be as a consequence, is something that I'm also sure that our panelists will discuss. Now, of course, Catholic social teaching does not mandate a specific form of political organization or economic organization. The church is very quick, uh, very clear not to dogmatize about that. But what it does do is offer a way of thinking about these problems. In particular, writers within the Catholic intellectual tradition have proven very fruitful, I would argue, in the tools that they bring to this debate. And I think that we can actually advance this, advance this debate by looking back about 100 years is there anyone in the room who's familiar with the writings of Hilaire Belloc or G.K. Chesterton? I'm seeing lots of hands, good. So this, this is not a representative sample, right? So maybe we can help spread the word. Chesterton in particular just has a turn of phrase and if you've read him, you understand what I'm trying to say. He's paradoxical and frustrating and wonderful. I love him. Hilaire Belloc, it's important to emphasize, was an important uh, influence on many thinkers within the classically liberal tradition and political economy. F.A. Hayek, who won the Nobel Prize in 1976, I always forget if it's 74 or 76, some year in that area was actually directly influenced by Hilaire Belloc's work, The Servile State, where Belloc argued that widely distributed and privately owned property was a key bulwark against a proletarianized society. So these arguments are not unknown even to those who are consciously situating themselves within the liberal tradition. And that also suggests some possible bridges between schools of the thought that might not necessarily have much to say to each other otherwise. Obviously, I'm partial to distributism since I'm writing a book about it, which I hope will be published by Catholic University of America Press. And if I wanted to talk about anything about that book tonight, it's that distributism really does say some interesting things about institutions that economists don't really have the conceptual vocabulary to talk too much about as of yet. In particular, this notion of freedom, the idea that you need a certain degree of independence to be commensurate, not just with personal human dignity, but also to maintain the free society, you have to be able, in some sense, to tell the market no. If everything is dictated by relative prices and incomes, if everything comes down to that, then you're not going to have the institutional bulwark to those social processes that might inadvertently erode human freedom and trample on human dignity. That's the claim, and I think it's worth taking seriously. So when we're talking about freedom, we are not just talking about uh, non-interference and non-restraint. We are talking about something more substantive, not just negative freedom, but a positive dimension of it also. I'll conclude by talking about the difference in common good capitalism between economics and political economy. Perhaps I should put it this way, the difference between economics and political economy and what that helps us understand about this debate over common good capitalism. Many people know the economist John Maynard Keynes. Few people, however, are, are aware of his uh, less famous father, John, May uh, excuse me, John Neville Keynes. But John Neville Keynes was also an economist. He wrote a lot about the method and history of economics. One thing in his works that I found particularly fascinating was this distinction between the science of economics and the art of political economy. He did not choose these terms lightly. 
These terms were chosen for a purpose. The science of economics pertains to all those things that have to do with choice under scarcity. We're talking about production, we're talking about distribution, allocation of income, these classic concepts that economists can talk about and have valid scientific knowledge on. But that is not the whole of the art of political economy. When we're talking about political economy, what we're really exploring are the philosophical foundations of a good society. What the relationship is between the good society and the free society, what the relationship is between both of those things and the common good is an open question, but you cannot solely reduce those questions to means ends analysis. You need good economics to do good political economy. Good economics is necessary for good political economy, but it is by no means sufficient, and we need to recognize that means and statements can only take us so far in this debate. So what we're really doing is exploring the space between predictive science and moral philosophy. That was a favorite phrase of the Nobel laureate James Buchanan, an economist who uh, was famous for popularizing social contractarian work who I admire greatly. So now we at least have the way of evaluating common good capitalism and its attendant policy proposals on at least two dimensions. And perhaps there are going to be more, but I think that this is a good first place to start. One, if we are trying to reorder markets to serve the common good, are our policies as the chosen means appropriate for the ends that we seek? If we want to achieve X to, uh, to get goal Y, does X actually give us Y? Are the means appropriate for the ends? That's one well-defined question, and I think that economics has a lot to say about that. But then, of course, we need to talk about whether the ends are worth having. We need to understand exactly what we're talking about at the various levels of society that comport with the common good, because every community, every authentic human community, has a common good from the family to the state to everything in between, and all those things necessarily harmonize with each other rightly understood. What can we actually do politically to bring that about? What can we actually do economically to bring that about? Before it's anything else, common good capitalism is a challenge to get us to think explicitly in these anthropological terms to try and understand how we can bring about that reordering of social institutions that comports with human dignity. Let's talk about how to do it. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'll take my mask off, but I'd like to thank the Institute for Human Ecology for hosting this event, as well as the good people at Mercatus for co-sponsoring. It's also very good to be back at the Catholic University of America. I'd like to offer some thoughts on our topic from the perspective of someone who has spent some time thinking and writing about natural law theory as well as the discipline of political economy that Alex mentioned several times, that I think really begins with Adam Smith. Now the phrase itself that is uh, the subject of much contention, of course, is the common good or common bonum as Aquinas wrote, and it's an old phrase. Uh, we find traces of it in Aristotle, but it also has some very specific meanings. And I think that's important because I think that in the discussion of common good capitalism today, for too many people, common good functions as a synonym for state intervention. And that's a hollow conception of the common good in general and the political common good in particular. Now, one meaning of the common good is the all-round integral flourishing of all individuals and communities. Now here, flourishing consists of our free choices for all those goods that make us distinctly human. Life, work, beauty, knowledge. Those of you who follow natural law debates will know what I'm talking about now. Well, who can be against any of those things? There is, of course, however, another way of describing the common good, and that is all those conditions that assist individuals and communities as they pursue human flourishing under their own volition. We find that used in Gaudium et Spes as well as Dignitatis Humanae. 
And those words assist and under their own volition are very important because I think they imply limits to state action. And this is what I think my mentor John Finnis and others call the political common good. And that concerns the role of government and law vis-a-vis -vis the common good of a specific political community. And the primary and immediate object of the political common good is not the all-round fulfillment of every member of that community. Because underlying that claim is Aquinas' argument that not all acts of virtue have the political common good as their object. The object of many acts of virtue is the private good of individuals, families, and other communities. And these acts fall outside the immediate scope of the political common good for which the rulers are responsible. So, I think a correct understanding of the political common good, at least as understood in the natural law tradition, puts clear parameters around government action. And that includes in the economy. Moreover, I think simply appealing to the common good does not always give us precise prescriptions about who should do what in the economy and in politics more generally. So let me turn to say something about the role of markets, markets and the common good. Now, as was mentioned by Alex, uh, of all the divisions splintering much of the American right, but I think rightly as well, the left, I think we're seeing disagreements about economic policy being among some of the deepest. And these disagreements are central to understanding those who invoke the phrase common good to explain why they believe more state intervention in the economy is necessary. For too long, such individuals contend, many of whom were mentioned by Alex, the prioritization of free market policies has inhibited, they say, necessary government action to realize social and foreign policy goals essential for America's general welfare. Now, in some cases, invocation of the common good by these, in, these mostly conservatives, but some liberals as well, refers to the need for state economic action to secure certain goals. A good example is employing tariffs to try and protect American manufacturing jobs from foreign competition. These policies, it's argued, promote broader ends like preventing particular communities and parts of America from descending further into social dysfunctionalism. Now, to my mind, renewed attention to the common good, especially the political common good as understood in the natural law tradition, is a worthy enterprise. Not only do I think it does it provide a more coherent framework for thinking through the foundations of politics than alternatives like utilitarianism, Rawlsian liberalism, and social democracy. As I mentioned before, I think attention to the political common good also helps identify principled limits to government power. Now, unfortunately, I think much of the present agenda associated with those who are calling for more activist economic roles for the state would, I suggest, significantly damage the economic dimension of the sum total of conditions that allow individuals and communities to pursue human flourishing freely. But also, I happen to think it's also obscuring clear thinking about the state's economic role in societies that believe that liberty and justice matter. So let's be clear about what we're talking about. One feature of the economic policies that are being advocated by common good conservatives is their piecemeal character. They're not arguing for something as sweeping as LBJ's great society. Instead, the picture is one of a selective application of industrial policies, regulation, tariffs, et cetera, to parts of the economy with the aim of producing better results in different sectors than would otherwise be delivered, they believe, by markets. Sometimes these policies are narrowly targeted. A recent article in American Affairs argued for, quote, entrusting a federal agency with the power to decide how the votes associated with index fund shares are cast in shareholder meetings of publicly traded companies. Other proposed policies have a broader scope. 
A good example is the advocacy of European style corporatist arrangements whereby unions who represent workers in specific industries would negotiate wages, conditions, productivity goals with trade associations that represent employers or you would have union officials on the boards of corporations. But I think the area that's animating many conservatives who favor more interventionist policies in the name of the common good is trade. In articles like Make America Autarkic Again, and in policies like the Trump administration's imposition of 25% levies on imported steel and aluminium, free trade is presented as often, if not usually, against America's well-being and downright harmful to specific American communities and industries. Now, I happen to think that in responding to these arguments, free traders have not made life easier for themselves by exaggerating trade liberalization's benefits. There is, in fact, no strong correlation between free trade and peace. Or by letting themselves become associated with Davos man imagery and rhetoric. Many were also slow to acknowledge that China's compliance with WTO rules has been poor and that Beijing if has, if anything, deepened its commitment to neo-mercantilist policies. Now, what, notwithstanding these failures, I think there's a considerable amount of empirical and historical evidence that highlights protectionism's negative effects upon countries adopting such policies. And these harms often fall on the particular groups they are intended to help. Now, I could say more about how, for example, different tariffs have affected and negatively affected consumers in general, but also the particular industries which they're designed to protect. But let me just say this. The long-term, I think, damaging economic effects of tariffs and related policies are very clear. And this is not a matter of spouting libertarian ideology. It's a question of the steady accumulation of empirical evidence and the development of sound theory over a long period of time. And a minimum, I think anyone who claims to be concerned about the common good should take this all into account. But you might say, what about justice? Surely the common good goes beyond economics. And that's true. Surely economic life is about as much the provision of work as lower prices for consumers. After all, work is something good in itself and lends itself to all sorts of morally and culturally beneficial behavior. Perhaps the argument goes every American should be willing to pay an extra $20 a year to help keep manufacturing workers, their fellow Americans, in particular parts of America, employed. Now, one difficulty with this position is that it downplays the way in which policies like tariffs damage the common good by facilitating cronyism, incentivizing rent seeking, discouraging adaptation to wider economic and technological changes, and promoting the highly questionable proposition that technocrats can outguess markets. As far as jobs are concerned, tariffs can't protect an industry and those it employs over the long term if that industry's comparative advantages are fading. Government intervention is a costly and generally ineffective way of trying to reverse or impede such changes. Moreover, I think if we really care about employment, we should question the wisdom of using government to indirectly encourage people to enter occupations that aren't going to be there in 10 years time and certainly won't be there in the same quantities. Then there are issues of fairness. This is issued, illustrated by the same manufacturing industry example. If the goal is to use the state to promote work as something good in itself, what is it about low-skill manufacturing jobs that merit special treatment compared to those, for example, who work in low-skill retail? Or to approach the fairness issue from another angle, should the state really be prioritizing the interests of one segment of the employment market over the overall well-being of 330 million American consumers. As my friend Richard Reich has observed, quote, we are all consumers, but we are not all manufacturing workers. Now, one of Adam Smith's crucial insights was that it's through meeting consumer demand that economies grow and adjust as humans are incentivized to specialize and exercise their creativity and their talents in light of people's changing needs and wants. 
Now, an important side effect of this process is that employment markets develop and mature over time. This not only promotes, provides more and different types of work for people with varying talents, needs, and wants, it also helps ensure that someone who grows up, for example, in a manufacturing town in Ohio may have many other job possibilities if they decide, like millions of other Americans, they want to follow a different line of work to that of their parents or grandparents. That's just one way in which I think markets indirectly contribute to the realization of goods like work. Now, for all the weaknesses, I think, of conservative proposals for particular state in economic interventions to promote the common good, the subsequent debate, I think, has created space for people to consider a related question, and that is, what can governments do to advance the economic dimension of a society's common good in ways that avoid all the problems that I just mentioned? Now, one way, I think, to think through this question is to consider what government institutions must do if markets are going to meet consumer demand and thereby create wealth and jobs, et cetera. Now, some immediate responsibilities come to mind, and many of these were spelled out with varying degrees of explicitness in Book 5 of Smith's Wealth of Nations. They include upholding the rule of law, protecting property rights, maintaining monetary stability, adjudicating contractual disputes, providing public works, establishing law and order, and securing national defense. To this, some would add a minimal welfare safety net, which is hardly a minor or inexpensive undertaking, as well as enforcing basic health and safety standards. Now, some might view this as all rather minimalist, but none of these are small, simple, or inexpensive tasks. Determining the particular rights and obligations of all parties embroiled in contractual disputes requires courts and the development of a body of law that helps judges make just rulings. Establishing conditions that help, us protect, help protect us from criminals and enable us to go to work every day requires the police power. Protecting America and its economy from hostile powers necessitates a military and national security apparatus. Now, truth be told, the present involvement of federal, state, and local government in the American economy goes way beyond all the tasks that I just listed. Over the past three years, government spending has averaged 38.1% of Americans' GDP, while American government healthcare, welfare and healthcare spending has increased. The number of pages in the Federal Code of Regulations has been growing for decades, nor can anyone claim that there's any shortage of industrial policies in America. So put bluntly, this is not limited government, and we do not live in a laissez-faire economy. Market fundamentalists have not been running Washington, D.C. for the past 50 years. So if we truly want to promote the economic dimension of America's common good, perhaps we should ask ourselves the following question. How would this aspect of the common good be enhanced by even more government regulation than we already have, even if it is of the selected, targeted type being suggested by some common good conservatives? Perhaps it would be better to think about how to focus government on those tasks that it is uniquely able to address instead of steadily expanding its potential to produce suboptimal outcomes or even worse, make serious mistakes. Now, the ways in which reflection on these issues would cash out in specific terms of specific policies are not going to resolve some of the debates we're going to have with regard to common good conservatism or common good capitalism. What, for example, qualifies as public works in the early 21st century? Or consider the challenges involved in trying to resolve real conflicts between good but not always compatible options, such as the demands of national security versus commercial freedoms. Adam Smith's dictum was, quote, defense is of much more importance than opulence. Now, few people, I think, would disagree with that. But how do we determine what constitutes a genuine national security imperative, especially given many businesses' proclivity to seek government protection from competitors, including American competitors, 
by asking for national security exemptions on very flimsy grounds. Now, those, I think, are some of the inexactitudes with which political leaders who are concerned about the common good must grapple every day. Yet I think that focusing on those objectives that only the state can accomplish, I'd argue, would produce a far more constructive discussion about the role of government vis-a-vis -vis markets and the common good than the arguments that I think that are currently preoccupying some conservatives. I also think it is a debate that is long overdue. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so I entitled my remarks, Common Good Capitalism in a Decadent Society. Um, we've heard a lot about the relationship between economics and politics, but I want, us to point, I want to point us back to the underlying cultural roots uh, that I think are really important for us to think about as we go forward in our reflections on this. Let me start by saying that when I look at the definition of the common good capitalism with Mark Rubio's quote, I'm thinking that's what my whole book was about, that the economy should serve people, that it should serve higher human goods. Uh, we need to reorient our thinking about those things. Um, and I want to add, I do not think it is wrong to think about what sort of institutional reforms and policy strategies we might pursue in service of these ends. Although, as we just saw, there might be some debate about what those would look like. Um, but I do not think that those <clears throat> such approaches are sufficient. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to look to some of the deeper roots of our problems, and they're rooted in our culture. Uh, and they need to be addressed lest our policy solutions have unintended consequences or, or do not work as effectively as we think they might. The way I want to get at this is by exploring what we mean by common good. And I should start off by saying I have not done a great deal of scholarship on what all these great thinkers in the past have thought about the common good. Um, but it does seem to me like it's a term that gets thrown around without being very well defined. The thin notion is the one that Sam pointed us to. Some idea of the common good is that we want material prosperity for all with probably an emphasis on how well it's distributed and, and a corresponding emphasis on state action. Um, <clears throat> but coming up from that, you would get a thicker conception, uh, a definition of common good centered around a thicker conception of the human good. It's not just a matter of who has how much stuff. Um, and we might start to name what some of these higher goods would be. The human goods of relationship with one another, uh, the one that's very important to my work, the cultivation of human virtue, developing our talents and excellences. Um, we could go on and on about these kinds of goods. Um, but I think that's kind of shared, at least with, with what I've heard so far. But elsewhere, I've argued that there's another dimension to the common good that we need to take on board, namely the cultural capital that makes it possible for people to pursue these higher goods. So it's not just a matter of the material basis for our, our flourishing. It's what we share together in the culture. Um, and what I have in mind is the way a culture can be deformed if it embraces the kind of anthropology embedded in our economics departments, in the neoclassical economics that gets taught in Economics 101. If we assume with those economists that more wealth is better than less wealth, and that as a result, incentives are a main driver of human behavior, and we tell our students not only that people often behave that way, which is true, but that they should behave that way because that's what constitutes rationality, we are forming people in a way that militates against the cultivation of virtue. If I'm the sort of person who's gonna make my decisions based on always wanting more and then you nudge me one way or another with your <clears throat> incentives, imposing costs and benefits to try to steer me, I'm not gonna learn how to step back and evaluate for myself what's worthy of pursuing in the life. I'm not gonna step back and develop the, cult <clears throat> the virtue of seeing my life as a whole. I'm gonna think about it in terms of discrete choices, I could go on and on. Um, the upshot, the short upshot, and a lot of my book goes on and on about it. The short upshot of this is that if you treat an instrumental good, namely more wealth or so on, <clears throat> if you treat that as an ultimate good, there's a strong push to undermine the goods of the polity or the culture. Um, 
That is, <clears throat> that is to say, it tends to undermine the kinds of goods of dignified work, community, justice, that would be advocated by people who are advocating for common good capitalism. There is a reason why Aristotle flags this problem of this, this idea that human happiness is pursued by relaxing our constraints, by getting more wealth, so that we can get as much as we desire. Aristotle flags that problem in book one of the politics, because people form that way are gonna pursue money as an end in itself, and that leads to corruption and all sorts of hollowing out in the culture. By the way, I think Plato flags it early on in the Republic as well. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, point one, if you wanna think about common good capitalism, you need to think about how to, how to retrieve a culture that can support people's formation um, in a better understanding of what the good life is. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna run by this one. There's this, a, a deeper layer to the idea of a common good, and that would be one that noticing the common good is, this, is the essence of our relationship with one another. There's a common good, for, the common good of marriage, for example, is the marriage. It's the relationship that subsists between the husband and the wife. Um, and again, our formation in a culture shaped by economic ways of thinking resists seeing how much of our good lies in the relationships themselves. And we think of things as stuff that we have or utility we draw from these things. But I am a sister, I am a friend, I am a daughter, right? There's a thicker way of understanding ourselves in relationship that, that we tend to forget. So that's another example of how a culture formed by economic ways of thinking can pull us away from the deeper understandings of what the common good is. But tonight I wanna to point to yet another layer. The common good is not just the conditions that allow us to flourish. The common good would be actually what you might take as being the most immediate meaning of the word common good. It's the good that we are jointly pursuing together, beyond ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so this is, I get this as an extension of Aquinas' reflection on human happiness of an individual. For Aquinas, happiness does not consist in a virtuous life, believe it or not, though a virtuous life is part of it. It consists in being directed to an object of desire that lies outside of the human soul. And since our desires are in fact infinite, this desire has to be directed to the infinite good, which is God. So for Aquinas, neither angels nor the universe are <clears throat> as objects, as a whole, are sufficient objects. And my argument would be in our culture, we absolutely do not have any such conception of a good that lies beyond us that we are jointly pursuing together. And the idea I have in the back of my mind is a team, a sports team has a clear idea of a common good. It's the joy of playing together, cultivating all their virtues, all those good things, and they wanna win, right? They're, they're pointing towards something. Okay, shortly before the pandemic, Ross Douthat argued that we are living in a decadent society. He defines decadence as something like um, the economic stagnation, institutional decay, and cultural and intellectual exhaustion at a high level of material prosperity and technological development. And his claim is that we are in the middle, we were living in a decadent society. For Douthat, the markers of our decadence are in the stagnation uh, that we see on the economic front, the slowing down of meaningful innovation. He knows the internet's happening, um, but meaningful innovation and the slowing down of economic growth is one marker. The second one, uh, which I think we should all see as a five alarm emergency, uh, is sterility the sharp decline in fertility, the fact that nations around the world are refusing to reproduce themselves anymore. Um, sclerosis is the third marker, the political gridlock. Uh, do I need to say anything more? Um, and, and I would add just sort of the institutional um, hollowing out and, and calamity that we have. And the final one is repetition, that our, the fact that our popular culture has scarcely moved in decades, um, which is my favorite point, and I won't elaborate on it, but he's right. Okay. Um, now, Douthat associates this decadence with the loss of some kind of common project. Uh, and he specifically says, <clears throat> up until the 1960s, we had the common project of trying to put a man on the moon. And this was some kind of national aspiration. Lots of cultures have sustained themselves with an idea of expanding their frontiers somehow or another. Something that lifts people outside themselves. The other obvious common good would be a transcendent orientation to God or some higher power. I would say you could also look at other cultures that are oriented towards the good, the true, and the beautiful, as Greek culture might have been, um, as something that lifts you up, and that the culture in general is pursuing as a project. The last thing I might add, this is implicit in Douthat's analysis, 
You need to have some kind of this aim in an affluent society. For many, many cultures around the world, the project of simply surviving is a sufficient common good to fire the engines of human purposiveness. This framing strikes me as an important part of the common good, some ultimate sense of purpose in a culture that gives meaning to all the other layers of the common good. A shared notion that it is important to worship God or to build an empire or get to the moon or just pass on a way of life that is cherished in a world in which survival is in question lends a sense of meaning to the kind of work we do <clears throat> and it makes it clear that we want to raise up children to carry on the project. Affluence clearly dulls our sense of having a common project of survival and we have no new frontiers and we also have no shared transcendent aspirations and maybe that's enough to account for our decadence. Be that as it may, I think we need to start explicitly thinking about what it means to build up a common good in a decadent world. I'm just gonna pick the dignity of work. I do think it's really important to find a world where people can have meaningful and dignified labor by which they can support themselves and their family and feel like when they're getting up in the morning they're doing something good for others through, the, through their labors. The question is, what kind of dignified work can you have in a culture that thinks that there's no higher purpose. Um, one thing that happens when purpose is lost, as Pascal has told us, if we take our eyes off the transcendent, people are gonna scurry around seeking diversions and distractions. Um, so what kind of meaning of work can we have if we're mostly busy working by making baubles or new gaming programs or things to distract us um, from the aching meaningless of our own lives? Does this not lead to certain kind of degradation? So few of us in the West are engaged in work that directly promotes the project of survival, and perhaps even fewer of us are directly engaged in work that aims at some kind of higher good. Many of us are engaged in what Dave Graybird calls bullshit jobs. There can be a kind of dignity in such work, a certain cultivation of talent, some development of relationship with coworkers and so on, certainly the ability to earn a living wage. But the ultimate end of all this is distraction and bullshit. Um, kind of puts a damper on the whole thing. And it raises the question of what sort of community we can build when we are desperately trying to avoid the loss of shared meaning. If deep down we know there is no point, can we get to the kind of communal ties that characterize groups that have shared purpose? Russ Hittinger has thought a lot about the common good, and in his reflections on it, he notes that the Catholic social thought tradition <clears throat> originate in response to perceived threats to the common good coming from the top down. He was worried, they, they were worried about the rise of communism, socialism, things like that. But he notes that there's two other threats to the pursuit of the common good from below, from the culture. The first is the cultural spread of a, tran spread of a transactional view of human nature that rests on the idea that more is always better. That's the first point that I made. The second threat from below um, is a spread of kind of the technocratic paradigm, this idea that we can manipulate and control the world to our own ends, um, which carries with it the idea that we can engineer good outcomes for people. And every time people talk about policy solutions, notice they tend to be talking about does out engineering outcomes for people. In both cases, it leaves us passive, passively riding along with the cultural winds and not exercising the agency that's essential to human flourishing, and it's not carrying with it the spirit of purposiveness that you would get from a culture that has a genuine shared common good. Okay. Um, so I would argue that these two from the bottom, these two threats from the bottom, I think are accelerated if not conditioned by a loss of internal sense of common purpose. Okay. Now it's beyond my pay grade. To, I think there's room, there's a role for institutional reform and good policy to help renew the cultural soil. I think it can provide a certain kind of training wheels. There's definitely room for that, but I leave it to the political philosophers who know more about it than I do. But I do want to say that the problem is rooted in the cultural soil. Is it because of excessive affluence, excessive flight from God? Who is to say? But we do not know what is worth living for because we do not know what is worth dying for. And insofar as that's true, it will be hard to build a common good in such a world. If this sketched out take is right, the church's main contribution to political economy in this age of secularism is to remind people of their transcendent ends. If we fail to get the orientation right, all the rest may be arranging so many decks of chairs on the Titanic. Um, I just want to point out a few features that to me reflect this decadence and what's going on. 
Um, a lot of young men have dropped out of the labor force altogether, and this is a trend that's been going on for a very long time. There's a lot of young men who are spending their lives in their basement, literally spending the equivalent of a full-time job working on their games and watching videos and things like that. Um, these are young men who do not have a sense of purpose. It's really real and it's out there. We're in the middle, in the wake of the pandemic, of this great resignation. I think a lot of the political instability and so on is people who are just restless, looking for something to find meaning in their lives. Um, so I want to say that this is a large problem that we should think about. I'll just close with a quote from Raram Navaram. Um, now, this was, Raram Navaram is written in a world that still had the transcendent end as a, as a salient part of the cultural soil. But even then, Pope Leo was able to write, the things of earth cannot be understood or valued or right without taking into consideration the life to come, the life that will know no death. Exclude the idea of futurity, and forthwith the very notion of what is good and right would perish. Nay, the whole scheme of the universe would become a dark and unfathomable mystery. And then we might just retreat to the metaverse and while away our time. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, uh, Sam and Alex. Um, excellent comments, um, reflections for, for each of us. I'd like to open it up um, for any questions in the, uh, I almost said congregation, but um, <laughs> yes, please. society has to pursue. Dr. Gregg, it seemed like at the end of your talk, you admitted that there are other ends besides economic efficiency, such as national security or defense. Adam Smith mentions that. But one of the big segments of your talk was arguing against economic independence or our autarky, uh, specifically through tariffs. The arguments you gave against tariffs sounded like they were framed within uh, a kind of economics analysis, namely the goods which you might try to, pr to promote through tariffs actually will, it, it'll backfire. You won't achieve them. But I wasn't clear from your talk, do you recognize, in, in the view of the political economy and economics that you're proposing, do you admit the legitimacy of such a political discussion where you say some measure, not complete, but some measure of economic autarky or independence may be one of the ends or political values that we want to pursue as a society. Then economics, that's a point of political economy, and economics will come in as contributor to that discussion and say, yeah, these won't work, but perhaps some, some new policy yet unthought of not tariffs, would be able to help us achieve that end. Unmask. So thank you for the question. Um, well, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, if one thinks about the common good, either in terms of the all-round integral flourishing of all individuals and communities, which is, in a sense, the highest form of common good. And then you have the other terminology, which you often apply with the common good concerning the conditions that allow that type of flourishing. Then, of course, I think that economics and questions of economic efficiency are about serving the realisation of those ends. So I want to correct any misapprehension that I think that somehow... Uh, the common good can be reduced to economic efficiency and effectiveness. Maybe in some economist's model you could try that, but I don't happen to think that's a good case. It's also not good anthropology, it's not good philosophy, it's not good theology, and it's not good culture either. I was very glad that Mary talked about that because I do think that is, in many respects, some of the problems that we are facing with regard to some of the communities that have been affected over the past 40 years as a consequence of different economic changes that have happened. So, that being said, are there things that a country wants to be independent 
Yes, obviously, I think there are. Uh, I don't think you probably want to be too dependent upon other countries for your national defence. I think this is the big problem that Europeans are having right now when they're confronted with someone like Putin who's willing to use power in the way that he is. You don't want to be over-reliant upon other people for some very basic things like national security and national defence. And economics can tell you that there will be trade-offs associated with that. So if you're going to devote whatever percentage of GDP to military spending, there's an economic cost to that. It's not even necessarily particularly efficient. Defence is one of these industries that's notoriously inefficient. Anyone who works in Washington to CC will tell you that. But we're willing to do it because we think that the good of something like national defence and the defence of the West more widely is worth the expense. What an economist will do will say, well, there are trade-offs associated with that. You need to be aware that there are trade-offs associated with that. An economist will also say, don't make the mistake of thinking that defence policy can somehow be a substitute for um, some type of economic policy. So economics in this, this respect, at least what I'll call, let's call it, basic economic principles, will give you information that you need if you're going to, to pursue some of these broader objectives that you think are in the national interest or in the common good of a particular na nation. It would be foolish to ignore that information and just pretend, well, that's not important. It's not worth considering. It certainly is worth considering. So I see economics in this respect as a tool. It's a tool that provides us with certain types of information based upon certain assumptions about the human person, which Mary in her book very rightly goes through and shows that there are limits to what this, this particular economic anthropology is and what it can teach us. But it also give, provides us with some very useful information so that political leaders whose responsibility is the common good of a given political community can make good decisions. Uh, we'll go here and then back here. Oh. Uh, thank you all. Although you you all said very different things, which I'm I'm tempted to just have you talk amongst yourselves. But I do think that one thing that ties all of your presentations together is the importance of work, that that economies produce work, and that work should be for the development of the human person, right? Um, and the question I have for um, all of you, but I think particularly for Dr. Gregg, is Aren't there ways in which we could tweak the models of the economy that we use so that instead of privileging 78-inch 4D HD TVs, blah, 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 right? Instead of privileging consumption and most efficiently satisfying people's increasing consumption demands, that we could instead satisfy the demand for productive work and that, that our current models seem to privilege producing more of these kinds of uh, uh, consumption goods and services rather than good work. That's a pretty big question. Uh, my, first, my first way of thinking about this is that economic models can answer questions such as, how will we choose to produce 78-inch screen TVs given that there's a demand for them to be produced? Will we produce 78-inch uh, TVs in comparison to other TVs, in comparison to other consumer electronics, in comparison to substitutes? Because on some margin, everything is a substitute for everything else in economics, right? A baseball game is a substitute for broccoli. So the question is, are we using these models in a sense of explaining the choices that people are making? Or are we using these models in the servants of advancing a normative and ethical perspective on the world? And I think that certainly if your goal is to get less of those things that you would prefer there to be less of, or at least less of uh, than the market is currently delivering, then, then economic models can help you do that in the sense that they will might, uh, they could possibly point to some curious places where you might look for a policy intervention that you might not otherwise see. But I think that first and foremost, economic science, as opposed, as opposed to the art of political economy, 
It's just about figuring out why people do what they do, and then what we ultimately choose to do with that is going to be based on the, uh, the broader philosophical considerations of the human person that we bring to social questions. So I think that's part of what drives me to want to think more about the cultural roots of art difficulties. If you live in a world where people think they want to have 78-inch TV screens, all these arguments are going to be, I mean, a lot of Sam's arguments are going to have a lot more um, power. Um, so, and, and, then, and I would ask, why do we want the 78-inch TV? Um, and and then that actually points to this decadence or deeper loss of meaning that we're just, and, and, and that's what worries me. Um, in terms of providing people with um, good and dignified work, I, you know, I haven't interviewed, I actually do know one of the guys in the basements. He's, um, my, <laughs> he's a 35-year-old guy who's never held a job. Um, and he has four people on his Twitch screen. But um, I'm not sure what's driving them out of the, out of the market. But it does feel, it's a flight to games. It's a flight to the virtual world. It's a flight from reality. Um, so, if we provided them a good working job, as you might def define it, producing something, would that get them out of the basement? I'm not sure that it would, because something else is going wrong there. Um, and, and I think maybe part of it's because I often asked to come talk at, at events talking about Catholic social thought, and where economics and policy are, you know, and politics are, are the top theories. And I kind of want to say that the Catholic tradition has something much more valuable to offer, which is a reorient reorient reorientation towards what really matters. Um, so quickly add to that. The problem you're talking about is a cultural problem. It's not an economic problem in itself. I take the view that culture drives everything and at the root of culture is our understanding of the human person and that ultimately goes back to what we think is ultimately important in life. Is it God? Is it transcendence? Or are we just living in a nihilistic world in which the object is to get as much pleasure as possible as, as in great quantities as possible? So it's true, I think, that markets can incentivize people to want certain things that might be objectively problematic. Pornography is a good example of that, right? But in the end, I think it's not the market that is at the root of the problem. The root of the problem are these anthropological and cultural questions. And I think the, the encyclical in the Catholic social tradition that best spells this out is John Paul II's Centesimus Annals, which I think is one of the better social encyclicals, precisely because it does take this cultural dimension very, very seriously. Another person who used to talk about this was the late Michael Novak. He used to talk about you have politics, you have economics, and you have culture, his three spheres. And he used to use the, uh, the Trinity as a type of way of talking about that. But he said, and I think rightly, that if you don't get these cultural things right, then there are limits to what the state, let alone different economic models, can do when it comes to generating different outcomes. Because I'm not sure it's the economy that's keeping your 35-year-old friend in the basement. I think there's something much deeper going on that an economy, let alone markets, can't fix in itself. I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and push back a little bit on that. Um, I do think the fact that we have a, a capital, capitalist society uh, means that we're bombarded all the time with advertisements telling us to obey our immediate desires and to go after that. I, I do think there is a cultural formation that happens through the way we think about markets. Um, now, I like markets a lot. I'm a big, big fan of them. Um, but I think in order to save capitalism from its detractors, um, there needs to be a bigger push against this sort of excessive pursuit of profits that can lead to things like, my favorite example is um, Addiction by Design by Natasha Shaudul about the um, video gaming industry in Las Vegas, um, where you have uh, corporations that have figured out how to hook people into these vo poker video machines and get stuck there until they get emptied out. It's a horrifying book on how they're actually plotting to drain these, their customers of all worth. We live in a culture that tolerates that kind of business model. Now, and that's an extreme one, but we also tolerate one where advertisers think it's perfectly willing to use every kind of emotional and psychological cue they can find to manipulate you to the end of wanting to buy their product. Um, 
so I think that's part of it. I, it's certainly not all of it, um, but it's part of it. Just add one, one more thing to that. The question I think we have to ask when it comes to some of the problems you're highlighting and some of the problems that Mary is rightly highlighting is we need to ask ourselves, who are the institutions that are most responsible for forming people in the habits and ways of thinking that enable them to resist that type of thinking? Well, the church is one. It hasn't done a very good job, frankly, for the past 40 years at doing this. And we see this, for example, with social encyclicals that talk about things that the magisterium has no business talking about instead of talking about some of these deeper anthropological and cultural questions. So um, there are, I think Mary's right, there are these models, there are these ways of advertising that are very insidious. Um, I, I think it's frightening when you start to read about some of the things that Facebook does to try and get you addicted, more or less, to this, this type of thing. But um, to deal with that problem, I do think you need institutions that are presenting a very different conception of the human person and understand that that is their job and that their job is not to talk about things like air conditioning. Yes, in the back. I've not yet read Deneen's book, By Liberalism Failed, um, about the successes, you know, contributing to failures or however you characterize it. Um, but I was just I'm curious to know from any of you, um, in light of the skepticism about capitalism that some are expressing today, how much of that do you think is related to the way in which certain industries behave? You mentioned Facebook and the video gaming. I was thinking of big pharma and other things that these are capitalist successes if you're just looking at the bottom line, but how much of the skepticism do you think is related to these distinctly predatory business practices, particularly the way they throw their weight around and influence policy and own politicians uh, because they have so much money they can just do this? And are people just, they're associating predatory business corporatism with capitalism and they're not just uh, is, is the message of what healthy capitalism getting lost in this milieu? This is one of the biggest things that I'm trying, I'm trying to defend capitalism against the excesses of capitalism. Um, and, and my model in my mind is small business capitalism, right? And I, I, and I think there's a lot of beautiful to that. And, and I know that the business school here at CUA is very heavily invested in articulating what good business is about. I think Notre Dame is about to start to carry on that project. Uh, and I think that's hugely important in this cultural moment. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm always a chicken little, just always a chicken. So, you know, over the last two years, we've, we've, we've wiped out however many hundreds of thousands of small businesses. Wealth has gotten even more concentrated. We've kicked everybody online, which gives the technological titans yet more hook into our brains. And, and I can't tell you how horrified, the idea, how horrified I am at the idea of the metaverse, but I'm just like, shoot me now. Um, so. <laughs> So, I, and, and to re-echo what, what Sam was saying, you can't look to government to solve this, you do need, but you do need to look to other institutions. Education, education would be one, but I think education by and large is also failing in that mission because we're busy trying to educate our students to get the top jobs in the tech companies. Um, so, anyway. This is one of the tricky things about markets. Markets are really, really good at giving people what they want. And one of the things that we need to appreciate is that might not always comport with a holistic conception of human flourishing. When it comes to business practices, we know that the market on the business side is always going to act as a filter for profit maximization. That's neither good nor bad per se. It ultimately matters how that works out in particular circumstances. But the fact of the matter is, if you replaced every business person in the United States with a random number generator and that determined business policy, it would still be the case that firms maximize profits. And it would still be the case because those businesses that randomly chose the most successful strategies would have the most resources available to hire additional labor, additional capital, expand compared to competitors. So there's a lot that we can say about how the market process works independent of psychological assumptions. So on the one hand, that's neat because it allows us to abstract from sometimes, 
uh, what the particular motivations of people who steer corporations are. On the other hand, it points to the power of the market as a social force that's going to work, how it's going to work independently of what we think or feel about it. And so I think understanding how little actually depends on the psychological assumptions that we bring to these things and how much depends on how markets work as a mechanism to drive certain results is something that we have to square a lot more honestly with if we're going to have this conversation about to what extent is a free enterprise economy commensurate with these broader social goods that we're interested in. I'll just add a couple of things. One is you, you, meant, you said the word predatory, which I think is very important because uh, I don't think a majority of people who, who are business leaders are particularly pro-market. There's a lot of them who are cronies, right? There's a reason why they have big offices in places like Washington, D.C. And, and Brussels, because they've decided that rather than competing in a competitive market, it's much easier for them to use their economic weight, their current economic position, to get favors from legislatures. There's a reason why Mark Zuckerberg goes around saying, please regulate me, because we know who's gonna write the regulations. It's gonna be people like him. Right? So that's, um, that's the first thing I, I would say. The second thing is, um, uh, the business community in America has not done itself any favors by buying into the woke agenda. They have not done themselves any favors at all. Uh, I can't think of an issue that has turned more people, from a variety of different political perspectives, by the way, against business, making them very cynical about businesses that talk about <clears throat> issues of racial injustice in the United States, which are real, but then say, well, uh, no one's interested in what's happening to Uyghur Muslims, right? So I can't think of many things that do more discredit to the free enterprise system than businessmen who talk this way. Milton Friedman said there were two groups of people who were particularly damaging to the, to the case for a free competitive economy within a particular culture, with rule of law and all these things. And he said, one are intellectuals. Well, that's sort of obvious in some respects. But he said the second were business people. Business people who would talk a big game about competition, but when it came to the crunch, wanted a privilege because their business was somehow meriting special protection from the state. So I think business has not done itself any favors by the way it behaves in this crony fashion, and the woke stuff, I think, has done even more damage to their reputation. I'm very glad that the, um, the, uh, the Bush School of Business has actually directly addressed this particular issue because they understand, I think, just how discrediting that is for the business community and the way it turns people who might otherwise be quite sympathetic to markets against them. I'm gonna come over to this side of the room in just a moment. Um, I'd like to offer a, a, a brief reflection followed by a question myself. <clears throat> Hopefully it'll serve as a summary. So I have an article coming out tomorrow on neo-integralism. Um, and in, in there I have a line of, you know, having failed, for, having failed to evangelize for two generations, uh, there are those who now seek to impose Catholicism from the top down. <laughs> um, and it, it, uh, you know, and uh, this, these, maybe these notions of common good capitalism are getting wrapped up in that kind of extremism. So I want to just point that out. But also I want to just, on the culture piece, the market and liberalism in general is a, reflects our subjectivity, our choices, what we value, um, who we are, uh, and if, it, if we are nihilists, then the economy and the liberal society is going to be that way. So short of a mass conversion and new evangelization that you know, sweeps across the country as wokeism has done, it seems to me that Marco Rubio and others are asking, what, what can we do to promote the common good, you know, short of that, you know, great, you know, uh, hope. And uh, I want to give one, so Dr. Greg, you focused a lot on, on tariffs. He, he doesn't in his talk, and, you know, but I know that others, you know, in, in this kind of common good movement do. Um, but are, what, what can be, what, what are things that are non-interventionist, that are not, like, what specific public policies, for instance, would, and uh, brief answers, you know, what specific public policies might you support, the three of you, that, that could advance the common good um, 
the, uh, so I'll give an example of uh, Marco Rubio mentions, you know, right now there are incentives for companies to buy back stocks. Why not change that incentive so that there's more incentive to invest in their workers or in, in infrastructure uh, or manufacturing? So what concrete, like, you know, is it paid family leave? Is it, um, uh, you know, increased child tax credits? Are there some specific, you know, uh, public policies that, that could advance the common good, w which don't, you know, have harmful um, secondary effects um, destroying the free market. Go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and start because I'm going to say I refuse your question. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm not saying there are not good policies you can pursue, um, but what should Marco Rubio do if he wants to lead us towards a better vision of a common good capitalism? He needs to share his vision of what the common good is and sell people on the goodness of dignified work and not buying 78-inch screen TVs and all of that. Um, so we forget that political leadership is not just a, a technocrat trying to engineer some kind of a good outcome. It's, par it's part of a conversation. The, the art of politics is a conversation about what goods do we value and why should we pursue them and then asking how, what's the best means to achieve those ends. Um, and, and for whatever reason, our discourse over the last, whoever knows how long, as long as I've been in economics, it's always geared towards policy makers. Uh, and I think that itself is very telling because it just assumes this cultural stuff is as given, we need to adopt to it as best we can without recognizing that the very stance of having this public policy discourse itself shapes the underlying anthropology that we're working out of. I'll just add, a, there are some things that can be done at the policy level. So if you're thinking about families, um, getting rid of things like land zoning and house zoning laws that make it very hard for people who need to move to get a job somewhere else in the country because the factory has closed down in one part of the country, they have a job offer in another part of the country, but it's really difficult to get a house because the local community has basically made it almost impossible for people to come into that community unless they are willing to pay enormous amounts of money. I mean, so there are little things that can be done like that that I think would alleviate some of the stresses that are inevitable to living in a market economy. I think Joseph Schumpeter was right when he said that creative destruction brings lots of benefits, but there's a downside to it, right? There's a lot of churn associated with it, which not everyone handles as well as everyone else. So I think people like... Um, the, uh, the German economist, the auto-liberal uh, Wilhelm Robke, talked about the need to try and make it easier for people to transition through these stages. And it's, sometimes it's the state that gets in the way of, of doing that. So that's one thing. But I agree with Mary that unless we're willing to have these deeper com cultural conversations at a public level, then we're really just dealing with the secondary types of questions. So one of my critiques of um, Senator Rubio is I can't find a concrete definition of the common good in what he says. I think it functions as a synonym for state intervention. Well, maybe there are cases in which the common good would lead you to that conclusion, but I don't see the language of political common good. I don't see reference to, to conditions about human flourishing, let alone the sort of grand vista that's opened for us by people like Thomas Aquinas when they talk about the common good. So I think that some of the things that we have to wrestle with when we're thinking of concrete ways to go forward are uh, two things that we've, we've hinted at but we haven't actually outright uh, talked about. One is this idea of whether the commercial sector really just amplifies our existing wants and desires or whether it can actually steer us and create wants and desires within us. There's certainly within the classical tradition and the Catholic intellectual tradition, this idea that wealth doesn't just augment but also enervates. And so that's a tension that we're going to have to discuss and honestly wrestle with, despite the fact that we might engage in mutually beneficial exchange to mutual advantage, it might be the case that just being as, wealth, as wealthy as we are without additional safeguards is bad for us. And that's not a very comfortable thing to think about or conclude, but it, it may very well be true. A second thing is the pedagogical function of public policy. Another thing that's emphasized in the classical tradition is that the state is not just a referee and the state is not just an arbiter. The state is a teacher. And it's not really good or bad that it is this thing. It's just that when you undertake public acts in the name of the community, these things have a teaching effect. These things have a formative effect. 
And so the expressive aspect of the policies that we're talking about under the rubric of common good capitalism can be evaluated in that dimension of whether they are appropriately formative. You don't necessarily get education solely from institutions that we decided are specialized when, with respect to uh, when it comes to education. You can and be, uh, frequently are formed by other ways. Now I think what the, most of those things suggest though is that when we're talking about interventions, there's the word that none of us have used yet, and I'm actually very surprised that none of us have used that word yet, which is subsidiarity. Uh, Sam, you just talked about it when you were talking about, you were talking about it when you mentioned zoning restrictions. That's something that almost always falls under the purview of local governments. But I think that why the American political scene might actually be particularly conducive to a reorientation towards these common good themes is because we have these meaningfully independent lower level political authorities that have the freedom to experiment with policies that balance some of these competing ethical priorities. And this idea that you can have the states as, as laboratories of self-governance and laboratories of democracy that can actually find ways to link up the otherwise, at least conceptually disparate, spheres of politics and culture and economics and actually find out which policies are best for forming the whole human person in a given context at a given time on the off chance that what people need in rural Georgia isn't the same as what people need in lower Manhattan. So, uh, my name is Sunny, uh, and uh, I studied uh, in developmental economics from Georgetown, and I'm from India. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, so my question is, uh, how can America or any other country embrace uh, common good capitalism when the world is increasingly becoming, you know, the global trade is increasingly, is increasing when, you know, if you consider most of the things in the room, electronics are, you know, none of them are made in the United States. Are. So how do you think we can embrace that change as a nation or an, as an individual? Do we have the courage and willpower to embrace the change that decentralized economies bring? And I'm asking this question as a practicing Catholic, concerned Catholic, practicing Catholic. So if I understand you correctly, the question was about how we can humanize economic relationships by embracing a more decentralized mode of production, consumption, and distribution. Is that correct? But tur tur was the idea commenting on global trade or turning global trade towards those more personalist realms? It's very difficult. I mean, the international division of labor is something that by its nature defies single national policies or single national solutions. The great thing about global supply chains is that they're incredibly robust, although not as robust as we might hope as we're learning the hard way right now. The difficult thing about them is that when we confront them, we recognize how actually little is due, is it within our power to alter by reflection and choice, precisely because so many of these production processes are so geographically and temporally spread out. And that naturally gives people a sense that they don't control their own destinies, and I'm sympathetic to that desire. At the same time, I don't think that moving more towards autarkic production actually helps. But at the same time, I don't think that you can just be completely blasé about these things. We do have actual national security concerns. We have actual cultural concerns. There are many, many reasons why you wouldn't just want to have your, your trade policy or your international production policy be whatever maximizes the dollar value of society's resources, right? Whatever, whatever puts us most in the black. There are all sorts of reasons why that would actually be destructive even of profitable production strategies even in the short run. No, all I want to say is you raised, I think for me, one of the hardest questions. So, I mean, we benefit a great deal from global trade. Uh, it's clearly lifted a lot of people up out of poverty. I don't think I want it to go away. Um, on the other hand, once we're involved in these networks, the impersonal forces predominate. And, and I think that's part of what makes it so natural for us to think that business just is about maximizing profits. And I, I could respond to what Alex said about that, but I won't do it here. Um, so, so the question is how do we keep some of those benefits of global production while also trying to rehumanize the economy? And I don't have the answer, but I, th I just wanted to say that I think that's the exactly the right question. I think we have one, um, maybe one more question. 
Hello. Um, I have a question about how, how does common good ca um, capitalism fit in with the themes of Catholic social teaching and also um, particularly how does it um, fit in with um, caring for those who, caring for those who are in poverty? I'll, I'll start. Um, I have a lot of criticisms of the current state of Catholic social teaching, which I'm more than happy to share to anyone who's willing to let me subject them to them. But what I will say is this. The principles of Catholic social teaching, things like the dignity of the human person, the principle of solidarity, the principle of subsidiarity, the preferential option for the poor, these are rooted in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. They are um, manifested in the writings of church fathers. They're exhibited in the lives of the saints. They have been given philosophical framework and, um, and buttressing by uh, natural law reflection. Uh, all these things, I think, are very important principles to bring to bear when we're talking about something like common good capitalism. I mean, even the phrase the common good, the Catholic social teaching utilizes this extensively as a way of talking about some of the things that we've been talking about tonight. So Catholic social teaching, at least the principles, I think, have a great deal to offer in terms of reminding us of the ultimate horizons to which all human beings are directed, that the economy is, is made for human beings, human beings are not made for the economy, but it also teaches us things like the social sciences are really important when we're trying to understand how to deal with questions, for example, you mentioned poverty. Social sciences like economics can tell us a great deal about how we realize this preferential option for the poor and how we avoid policies that actually lead us in the opposite direction. So I think at the level of principle, Catholic social teaching, and as well as the, the sheer amount of thinking that Christians have done over the centuries about these types of questions is extremely important for giving content and form to anyone that's trying to think seriously about how do we make a, a market economy live and function in accordance with an anthropology of human beings that's true, that's true. So I think Catholic social teaching has a lot to offer here and unfortunately, I think a lot of it gets blurred. A lot of that is blurred when um, the magisterium wanders into talking about things that it doesn't have the competence to talk about. So we've heard a couple of times that the church doesn't offer models, right? So it says that in the encyclicals, but actually it does. 1931, corporatism is the model that's offered to the world, right? Um, so, so there are problems with Catholic social teaching, which I, but I think the problems are they are obscuring the, the importance of these principles that can help us to think very clearly about what type of market economy we want to live in and what types of market economies we don't want to live in. So a market economy which views human beings as purely utility maximizers, a market economy that assumes that there's no good, everything's a matter of subjective preference, a market economy that takes the view that Human beings are a means to an end. That's very different from the type of market economy that, I'm that I try to talk about. And when I try to talk about it, I try to talk about it in terms that don't necessarily come at it from the standpoint of people knowing that I'm a Catholic, that I take these principles seriously, but to show that these principles of Catholic social teaching can be universalized. I think Sam just gave a really good answer to it. Um, so, I mean, the church has room to say that markets can serve human beings, and I think that's important to remember. Um, the spread of markets, in fact, lifted up billions of people out of poverty, right? So you, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, but the whole, the whole invocation of the language of common good capitalism is to say it is meant that, that the economy is exactly meant to serve that kind of purpose of lifting people up, bringing up human dignity, enhancing the human condition. And insofar as market conditions in our contemporary economy don't do that, they should be called out for critique or for reform or these sorts of things. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's been maybe not named expressly tonight so much because it's actually been one of the implicit premises of the whole conversation. <laughs> 
just to build off of that, I also think that the principles of Catholic social teaching give us a more robust way of understanding what the problem of poverty really is. It's not just the case that poverty means a lack of material resources. It does mean that in part frequently, but the idea that we have done justice to the actual human persons, uh, persons just by enacting some sort of minimalist welfare state that shuffles around resources and gives people stuff but doesn't do anything more than that, that doesn't do anything that gives them access to productive work, that doesn't put productive assets or productive capital in their hands and helps them make a go of it. That doesn't really exhaust our obligations. It certainly doesn't exhaust our obligations outside of the state, and it probably doesn't even exhaust our obligations in terms of, of what we can do collectively through governments to actually satisfy, satisfy those obligations that we have to other human persons. So I think that when it comes to poverty, common good capitalism actually does the world a great service by shifting the entire paradigm to realizing it's just not about I can't consume as much as I want to, and I would like to be able to consume more. We need to think about poverty more holistically than that. I'm sure we could go on for another half an hour at least. And we can indeed, but it's gonna be over there where the coffee and the cookies and stuff is. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone else and all of you for coming too. Thank you.